Mr. Ryan Griggs. This is uh, this has been a long time coming. I'm looking forward to speaking today, bro. Heck yeah, man. I've been ready for this. Hell yeah. So, Ryan, what do we need to know about you to make sense of the stuff you're doing today? Yeah, so <clears throat> as you can see, I'm wearing, I've got a bison on it. It's uh, called the Regenesance, and that's my apparel brand that I started May, of 20, May 28th of last year. And the whole reason why I started all this is actually because of the last three years of my life have been nothing short of a train wreck. Um, and it just goes to show how fast your life can change. And so growing up, I, I've had a, a fairly comfortable life and pretty straightforward life. Went to college, had a really great tech job down in Austin, working for IBM. And then right as the pandemic started, um, I found out that my brother, my older brother, had stage three colon cancer. And up until that point, I've never really had a lot of family stuff happen. I've had, a, I have a small family. I mean, I lost my grandmother in high school, but outside of that, I had never really had a whole lot of trials and tribulations. So that was a huge wake up call because I knew as soon as I heard that news, that if I'd ever progressed to stage four, that I'd go be his caretaker. Unfortunately, December of 2021, or 2020, uh, found out that had progressed to stage four. And so I had to make the executive decision to take the first six months off of work of 2021 to go back home to be his caretaker. And that essentially began hell on earth for me. And so I knew cancer was bad. We all know cancer is bad, but it's definitely one of those things that unless you see it firsthand, you don't truly realize how horrific it is. It's nightmare fuel essentially um because i remember the first day i walked in and saw him that night so whenever i first went back home the the plane was i was going to be staying at his apartment and i was going to take care of him at my parents place where he was staying at that lasted a day because i remember that first day i was just drinking and smoking weed just so i could fall asleep that night because that's how bad it had already messed me up and uh yeah, that just really began the really hellish journey of that to where between the cancer, all of the opioids, the chemo treatments and everything, I essentially was watching him be tortured alive. Uh, and then the last two and a half months of that, he spent in the hospital, actually, because they had been taken for all of the pain and everything, had essentially blocked his whole entire system so badly that by the time the hospital came he was so backed up that essentially a hole in his colon just opened up and he had a perforated bowel and so i had to call 911 and he had to have emergency surgery that night and if he didn't he would have died and looking back i really wish he would have because the hospital i've shared my full experience through all of this on a different podcast if the listeners would actually be able to want to listen I shared it on the Meat Mafia podcast of the true details of what it was like for those six months um, with the hospital. There's still a lot I couldn't even really talk about, just how horrific what I saw and what I heard, especially considering it was my older brother. And I watched him pass away on June 11th of 2021, three days before his 33rd birthday. While all of that was going on, I was also taking care of my very ill mother. So back in 2019, she was forced to retire from her health. She had shingles, gout, sleep apnea, coronary artery disease. So the most common form of heart disease, her kidneys and liver were failing and needed uh, transplants for both, but she was deemed inoperable because of her heart. And in total, she had 12 liters of fluid uh, drained from her lungs. So if you think just those giant liter bottles, think 12 of those, that was in her lungs across, I think, six different trips to the ER. And so she was really suffering as well. So after my brother died, I knew uh, I did not want to go back to, to the tech world. That really opened up to, to me trying to figure out, okay, I'm, I'm already kind of sick of having my, a boss. So I actually withdrew my 401k. I quit IBM, not knowing what the hell to do. Um, so the last six months of 2021 was, I guess, quote unquote, soul searching, but also I was just so destroyed after watching my brother died. I, I now realized how bad of the PTSD I had 
I couldn't sleep till five or 6 a.m. I had to just smoke an insane amount of weed just to sleep. I would purposely do that too, so I wouldn't dream because I would just have the worst nightmares of everything with my brother. I'd wake up just heart racing. My bed is just covered in sweat. And it just felt like I just had a panic attack just straight off the gate. Still not knowing what to do. I was just trying different things. I'm really into Bitcoin and, and music. And I was trying those things, but nothing was really sticking. And while all that was going on, my mother was still getting worse and worse. Um, and this is where Twitter came into play. Because oddly enough, that social media platform saved my life. Because... Again, through all that soul searching, I was following a lot of accounts and I was essentially just doom scrolling. But I realized looking back to that, I would say I went to Twitter University because I was learning so much and also unlearning just as much, too, which was a crucial point because I was vegan for two and a half years. And that was during everything with my brother stuff. And so Twitter woke me up to realizing I was wrong about that. So I switched back to eating meat. And a bunch of other things that I was really learning. So fast forward to January of 2022. I randomly stumbled upon, I guess, the homesteading and, and agriculture sector of Twitter. And I heard about regenerative agriculture. And that was my light bulb moment of, oh, shit, I've been so disconnected from my food my whole life. And I think that's the missing link for my case with my family, because we grew up on the standard American diet. I ate like shit growing up. It was just pop tarts before uh, school, two sodas a day, che Cheetos, all kinds of garbage. I mean, I played sports, but I, my diet was so bad that I always had health issues because of that. And so I had this huge road trip planned for, for 2022 because the one thing my brother and I would talk about whenever I was taking care of him to keep the hope alive was traveling together because we never did any road trips, but we'd always loved traveling and, and cultures and food and whatnot. So I was doing that in 2022 and actually visited some farms. And the very first time I was on a ranch and had food that was just from the backyard. They had a fresh garden. It was from the, the, the beef that they had it was a life changing meal because I had again realized a, I've been missing out on this my whole life. And B, this is nothing like what I have been used to in grocery stores. It tastes so much better. And I know for a fact, if I be eating that food every single day, I wouldn't be thinking about all of the garbage that is out in grocery stores and all the fast food restaurants and pretty much now restaurants too. I'm, our whole food system is just all out of whack. And so... I knew right away that this is exactly what I want to do. I don't, I'm, I, I want to work on a farm, help educate myself and see how I can use this to help America because I, I'm just so sick of what's happened to our country, especially after everything I've gone through. Cause obviously I don't know anyone to this day that's been a caretaker at that young of age for a sibling or, or loved one at their young of age. But so many chronic diseases are so prevalent in America now to where my my story isn't so common or isn't so uncommon, which is a tragedy. And I so I continue on this road trip and I, I'm skipping over a lot as well because I had my own health issues after this was happening. And I could not figure out why the doctors did fuck all to help me. I spent thousands of dollars on tests and whatnot. They still couldn't help me. Um. And so I had a farm lined up in September of 2022 in Pennsylvania. I finished this road trip around America. I met some friends through Twitter and things were slowly picking up for me in a way because I, I, I'm still obviously destroyed with everything with my brother and obviously my mother's health was getting worse. I knew she didn't have much longer, but there's that impending doom feeling of you don't know when that's going to happen. So I started this farm in Pennsylvania and I shared that on Twitter and I shared my story as well and, and what I wanted to do. That went viral overnight and I realized there's something to this. People are coming to the same realization as me to where, oh shit, with the pandemic, we were closed down for so long uh, and it just has you thinking about health. And then you see 
someone sharing that they're working on a farm and all that. And they're thinking, yeah, I've, I've been experiencing the same thing to where I don't know if I've gone to a farmer ranch or talked to a farmer or rancher. And, uh, so those two and a half months on that farm, I was just working every day and, and, and sharing everything. And it was so incredible despite again, having these awful health issues. Cause I actually ended up having to leave the farm early because I couldn't figure out what was going on. After that, I had more farms and ranches lined up for 2023 of last year. And I had a bison ranch lined up actually February 1st. I just realized it's February 1st for recording mm -hmm. one month or one year ago on the dot. I was supposed to start on this ranch in Montana. Uh, because through November of 2022 to February 1st of 2023, I took the time off to figure out my health. I hired somebody from Twitter and that's actually whenever I discovered my whole entire health issues. This is what's so infuriating with healthcare. Not a single doctor recommended me taking a thyroid blood panel or a vitamin mineral blood panel. This wow. guy I had found on Twitter had me take those two and that answered all of my health issues from the previous 18 months. Who was, was that? Say that again. Who, who was that? Uh, Alejandro AD. And not only that, this kid, he's 18 or 19 whenever I hired him and he went through awful gut issues himself in Mexico and he just figured it out and healed himself. And so he just wants to help others. So this 19 year old kid just helped me more than anyone in healthcare who's had this formal training. And yeah, it was just mind blowing that those two tests answered everything. I, I was deficient in quite a few vitamins and minerals, which now looking back, makes sense. I didn't realize all the stress, lack of sleep, poor eating, and then taking care of my brother that depletes your body of everything. But the second and more important thing is I had developed a, a serious autoimmune disease, Hashimoto's, which is a severe form of hypothyroidism. And that explained all of my, my symptoms and conditions and why uh, I was not feeling recovered at all. Poor memory, brain fog, just insane fatigue thinning hair and brittle nails and i have super coarse thick hair like it turns into afro and everything was thinning out <clears throat> so january of last year i was going to take this thiamine supplement because that was one of the things i was deficient in and so i started taking that one week before this bison ranch adventure in montana and i was in boise at the time i guess my colon was so inflamed that I had a severe reaction to this because over the course of three days, I went to the bathroom about 90 times. It was all bloody. I had the most upper abdominal pain I've ever experienced, but also upper or lower abdominal, all these crazy gas noises happening. I had uh, fever and, and cold chills. I, I could barely eat or drink anything. And I was just bedridden essentially. And so it was a Friday night and I told myself, obviously, there's two options, e urgent care or, or ER. This is obviously way too serious for urgent care. So I told myself the next day I'm going to go to the ER. Saturday, like 6.30 rolls around. I had to head straight to the bathroom. And I sleep with headphones in, wired headphones with rain sounds because my body is still default f fight or flight mode just from everything with my brother to where I'm such a light sleeper because I had to be to take care of him. And so I'm sitting on, on, on the bathroom and I started profusely sweating, thinking that, oh, I'm about to throw up right now. But as that was going on, then my, my hearing started getting really muffled and then my eyes were closing in and I realized, oh shit, I'm passing out right now. And so I hobbled to my bed. It was happening so fast, but in my mind it was happening really slow because I was thinking, I'm in this Airbnb loft by myself. I don't check out until noon tomorrow. I don't know why I'm passing out here. I don't know if it's just like an organ failing or something. And so I was panicking, obviously, and trying to figure out what was going on. And I learned that day that you could talk yourself out of not passing out because I just vividly remember over and over in my head, I was just saying, Ryan, you motherfucker, you're not passing out here. And I took a couple deep breaths and slowly but surely my hearing came back. My eyes were opening again. And I drove straight to the ER and it was, it was like 7.30 in the morning, still dark out in Boise. 
it was sleeting out, but thank God no one was on the road because I just ran every red light just to get to the ER. Made it there. They did a bunch of tests and yeah, confirmed. I just had a really inflamed colon. And I knew the quickest way to get into gastro to do the colonoscopy and endoscopy was to come back to Austin because I had already had established relationship. So they sent me away with some meds and it was about 5 p.m. that day. I could feel myself on the verge of passing out again. So I drove back to the ER and it makes sense now. I was just severely dehydrated, obviously, from going to the bathroom 90 times, not eating or drinking. And so they gave me two liters of fluid because of their fuck up, because that's on them. Obviously, I'm such in a in a awful state of mind. I don't know why. I, I mean, that's their job is to, course, to figure yeah. it out. Because of that mess, they ag- added on $3,000 to my hospital bill. Fortunately, I can talk about it later. It's I'm part of a, an awesome organization called Crowd Health. I only ended up paying $500 of that. But again, that just on top of everything that's already failed with me, with my health care, with Hashimoto's, the things that I could talk about with my brother, with my mother, just, just another example of how they fail us. But so many people are unaware and they would just end up paying those costs. So I come back to Austin. I do the colonoscopy and endoscopy. Fortunately, it's not cancer. It's just a really inflamed colon. This is also was really interesting. They never diagnosed if it was colitis or Crohn's or cancer. They just said they couldn't figure it out other than it was really inflamed. So I was in the mindset that I'm going to be in Austin for the next three months and go back to this ranch in Montana in May. Because after that, I had farms lined up in Italy. I had three farms lined up in Sicily, Bologna, and Milan for the rest of last year. And then I was just going to travel the world, uh, parts of Europe, parts of Asia, and parts of Africa to, again, show show that as a way to reconnect us back to food production and just giving the farmers and ranchers a voice because that's just been completely gone. As I was recovering in Austin, I was just on a walk and a random thought popped into my head, which is now the Regenaissance. I had that thought to, again, we're so disconnected. And for whatever reason, apparel came to my mind because we are so tribal by nature. It's a, it can be a great way to build a movement per se uh, around agriculture. And so, Regenaissance. I wish I was smart enough to come up with this term. I'm not. One of my best friends, Case. We almost did a podcast a year previously called the Regenaissance Podcast because it takes two words, which so perfectly explains our culture right now regenerative and renaissance so regenerative our bodies are so resilient and if you take care of it after uh months of of going through hell or years it can regenerate if you if you take care of yourself properly but also regenerative agriculture agriculture for america up until now has pretty much been doing it the wrong way and Again, that's whenever I heard regenerative agriculture, it more aligns with nature and it doesn't destroy the soil. It regenerates the soil because if we do sustain sustainable agriculture, that won't work because we've destroyed the soil for so many years that we literally need to regenerate it. And so that's the regenerative part. And then Renaissance. When you think of liver king, take out all of the steroids and all of, all of him lying about all of that. He brought organs, nose to tail and all that to back to the mainstream. You see bone broth and collagen and bone marrow have just had this explosion of growth. It's going back to how we've always eaten. Um, but not just that. I also have a bison. I was very intentional about that because bison are incredible for, for our land for our soil health and then for us as well they almost went extinct but now they're making a resurgence as well and i just think we're just in this renaissance of we're just going back to how we we operated with with food uh again the pandemic really woke up a lot of folks and it seems like as time continues to go on more and more people are waking up and uh 
yeah, as that was continuing to go on with with this, there was another idea that I had for raw milk because as this was as I was learning about regenerative agriculture and agriculture and the history and how we've gotten to to the point where we're at with our food system, I started learning about the history of raw milk because I was in the same boat as majority of people thinking that it should be illegal because it has all these pathogens and it kills you. And that could be that could not be more wrong. Um, and so I have another shirt with the tagline Bra's Law. So this whole point of Regenesance apparel brand is to have some cool looking apparel because whenever I was doing my research, I realized outside of the brands themselves for the farms and ranches, there's nothing out there at all. Uh, and so I found this huge opportunity to really bridge this gap because that's my strength is talking to people. I'm obviously, I worked on a farm for a couple of months and I, I want to have a ranch down the road, but I, I, I know very little compared to the actual farmers and ranchers, but I realize there's not a lot of folks really trying to bridge this gap. And on top of that, there's so much misinformation again with raw milk, for example, that folks don't understand what's right from wrong. And so I really want to raise awareness and educate around the whole food system. Why butter and steak and saturated fats are actually incredible for you why we need animals on pasture to really help with soil, but then also for our health because animal agriculture is not causing climate change. That's a load of crap. I really want to push back to the vegan agenda. Cause again, I was vegan for two and a half years. I was quite passionate about it. I wasn't this militant vegan that most are, but what's crazy is they're only two or 3% of the population, but they're so outspoken. The other side of things, it's just very defensive. And so I want to, really push back to all that because we have the answers. If you just look at the history of, of again, how we've gotten to this point, how we've advanced as a civilization, we have done that from an animal based diet, not plant based. And then lastly, I've ended up adding a podcast with this apparel side to again, continuing with the education, raising awareness, but also giving the farmers, ranchers, and all the other folks that work in agriculture voice, because that was the single greatest decision of my life. Everyone I, I meet is just such awesome people that, I don't know, it just, it makes me, despite everything, it makes me super grateful for where I'm at now. Uh, because going back to my mom's stuff, her health was getting worse and worse. I had... May 28th is the launch date of last year with my apparel and mother's day rolled around and that hit me like a train wreck because I would realized I'd suppressed everything with my mother throughout that whole entire two years, because I was just trying to overcome everything with my brother and myself also trying to figure out my life. And so I was barely functioning, even though I was trying to get this apparel launched. It was May 28th. That's Memorial Day weekend. It was a Sunday. I had it scheduled to launch at noon central. And my whole life, my mother, she was the one that would be texting, calling me essentially every single day. As she really declined, she stopped doing that. So I had to be the one to do all of the outreach. That Friday, the 26th beforehand, she randomly texted me asking for my website, which obviously I was happy, but I just was kind of confused because she hasn't texted me for quite some time. I now realized why, because May 28th rolls around. I launched my website, had great success. Uh, I mean, I never had plans to ever start a, a, a business of my own. I was able to start an apparel brand in two and a half months to where I had actual legit products. Four hours later, I get a call that my mom died. And so I, I went from one of the highest points in my life to the second lowest point in my life in the span of four hours. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, that was just a whole whirlwind to where I, I had to go back home to say goodbye to my mom. And I remember as we're burying her, uh, just seeing right next to that was my brother's grave. And that was the first time I had seen that since the day he died. 
or since the day we buried him too. But this is why I love Regenesance and again, Twitter, because I've glossed a lot over that too. I've met the greatest people in the world through Twitter that have become my best friends. Again, with agriculture too, that despite all that fucking hell, that love truly wins because it's in tandem with gratitude. The more you practice that with love, because it's not just love of one another, it's just love of life. When you just find those things that you really enjoy, just go outside and you hear the birds chirping and, and you just look up at the sun. You feel like a million bucks after that. But that's why with my mission, it carries me with everything. Because I think about my brother every single day. I truly don't know if I'm ever going to see him again. Not just that. I have all the... I have an incredible amount of memories with him, but I also have these awful voices in my head that I wish could go away of just the awful experiences that I saw and heard of my brother. And so that's, I don't know if that's ever going to go away. I don't want to say never, say never, but focusing on the love, focusing on my mission, focusing on the people that are here, but then also honoring my brother and mother and every other Griggs that came before me was the ways they were finally able to overcome that. So now it's February 1st, 2024. It didn't take until last month, essentially, that I was, I'm finally feeling like myself again after those years. I'm just going to leave it at that now. I just realized I went on a long rant for all of that. <laughs> Brother, I just want to give you a hug, man. I have, I have tears running down my face and I mean, I'm just, I'm grateful for you. <clears throat> and I, having experienced that and such a key concept in my life and of what I try to highlight on the podcast is the obstacle being the way and if I if I had a mantra that I I truly would put on a billboard or I, I truly would want to live up to it would be the obstacle being the way um you think you think that's been true for you absolutely I actually tweeted this not like two days ago <clears throat> this is for men at least I think the three keys to a successful and fulfilled life are finding your mission, finding your tribe, which includes family, blood or not blood, you wanting to have your own kids, etc. And then the third thing, which is crucial, is simply never giving up. And I think that goes with the obstacle in the way, <clears throat> because I think there's a difference between pivoting and quitting. So for my example, it took me about 18 months to finally figure out my life, but I kept pivoting. I had a great paying tech job that I felt so unfulfilled and did not give a, a shit about because it was B2B and I just wanted to be my own boss. Going back to tech would have been quitting for me. And so I, no matter what kept going, obviously, <laughs> despite ha starting an apparel brand and Realizing that I have something legit, I was still going through my own shit still it, two years later and then losing my mom. It wasn't until literally last month to where I'm finally feeling great. But that's simply because I, I refuse to give up. And I also know that I'm only 30. Life will continue to happen. I don't know. I mean, I have a father. I, I don't know how long he has left. So, <laughs> yeah. But that's why I also say finding your mission and finding your tribe are so crucial because I think if one of those three are out, then you're going to really struggle because I sought out my friends that I've made now from the last couple of years and they have supported me through hell. For example, like the Meat Mafia guys, Brett and Harry, whenever I was in the ER, I texted a picture to Brett of me just laying in the hospital bed, he immediately texted. He was willing to fly out to Salt Lake City and take my car and drive all the way back to Austin. That's a 24 hour drive. <clears throat> I didn't, I refused to, to, for him to do that. I, it meant the world and I ended up making it back. But they were the first two I saw when I came back to Austin. When I had my colonoscopy and endoscopy, Brett was the first person, literally when I woke up, 
the day my mom died is when I saw them. And then just everything since then with my apparel, just with everything, they have just been a huge support. And there's so many other people that I've met in my life that have just had my back. And so I can't, I can't fail with that so long as I don't give up and continue to take action. And I've made sure to do that. And so that's why I, I wholeheartedly agree with you saying that. Because for me, it's such a cliche saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But I'm a living example of that. Because my whole life, I've realized a lot of my thinking has been ahead of the curve. But I was so much of a coward that I did not act on any of it. And so once I was able to overcome everything with my brother, it's turned me into an unstoppable force that the only thing stopping me is death. That human spirit, dude. It's, it's something I don't think too many people have. They haven't gone through the struggle to realize how strong that spirit is. And I, I mean, that, that healing process, like that shit isn't easy. I, I I can't imagine the mental burden of it, but having gone through some health stuff as well, the, the physical side of it isn't easy as well. And combining those things together and doing them both at, at the same time is it takes it takes a strong will to be able to do that, dude. Do you is it is it unique to you at all? Or do you think it's solely just humans have this ability to overcome? I think there's some uniqueness to it, but I also, I think there are quite a few people that if they would go through the stuff that I've gone through would turn them into conquerors, but I also think there's an insane amount of people that would A, legitimately take their life or B, just give up on life. And like I'm saying, they would have quit and gone back to that comfortable job and just would have coasted throughout their whole life. So that's why I have so many goals in and everything I want to do with Regenesance, but it's all under one umbrella. And that's simply because I truly believe if you fix the problem with food and you develop these relationships with farmers and ranchers and you realize how awesome that food tastes, that you won't experience what I've gone through. And I don't wish what I've gone through on my worst enemy. And that's, it's really as simple as that as to what's my goal with Regenesance. Because my whole mission in life is breaking the generational chain on health and nutrition because I'm going to be doing that for my family. And I hope through Regenesance, others will be doing the same. So what, if you were to summarize what, what you want people to take away from what you have experienced, if there was, if there was a lesson that you would really want to just stress to people having learned through these uh, past four years, what would that be? I mean, I definitely agree we are stronger than we realize. Like when your back's against the wall, it's sink or swim, but it's so simple. That's why I think it's just simply never giving up. I, I've noticed in these last four years too of highly successful folks, that's a very common denominator is just never giving up. For business people, it'll be their sixth or seventh attempt of starting a business to where before they finally achieve any glimpse of success. And yeah, I'll just leave it at that. It's just, I think it's simply refusing to give up and having unwavering belief in yourself. But obviously you need to back that up with actual action. You can't yeah. be just saying all this stuff and then just mental masturbation and, and you're not doing anything because that's a very easy trap to fall into. Absolutely. And I mean, we, we spoke on the phone not too long ago and um, this guy Brute to Force came up. And um, I, I bring him up now because I, I actually listened to one of his podcasts yesterday and just this concept of relentlessness and of, I think he called it like the infinity clip and that the people who are successful in life, um, they don't really care if they succeed on the first attempt of something because they know that they're just going to keep shooting and they're going to keep going at things. And um, I see now why so much of his philosophy and, and the stuff that he talks about resonates so deeply because it, it is those things that separate 
the successful and the unsuccessful. I mean, it reminds me of listening to his podcast on uh, the creator of the Dyson um, vacuum. And I think it was 12 years of him just chipping away in his basement and failing time and time again to try to get a fucking vacuum right. 12 years and thousands of iterations. And then finally he got it. Um, but there, there's such few people who have the, I guess it would be a self-confidence to, to keep pursuing something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to, to really explain because I didn't have this one defining moment to where all of a sudden I just really had unwavering belief. I mean, you stayed at my house, you saw all the post notes I have around like it's a constant war in my mind every day, at least still right now, of um fighting with my autoimmune condition because I mean that's gonna heal for sure. Um but just the sheer exhaustion from all that paired with everything that I've gone through, I have to remind myself why I'm doing what I do every single day. But also going back to um, I, this is kind of backtracking a little bit. Whenever you asked if it was unique to me or other people, I think for me too, I've realized I wear my heart on my sleeve. So once I gain that unwavering belief in myself too, I stop caring with truly what others would perceive me on mine. And so that's why I was just truly my authentic self with Regenesance. And I've also realized that's why so many people have resonated with it. Uh, to where the the people I'm talking to right now, it's mind blowing how it's not even been a full year of, of my brand being opened, and I truly believe this is going to take America by storm. Just from the people I'm talking to right now, I cannot imagine what it's going to look like in five years. Uh, but I've realized it's just because I'm I'm being people can see that authenticity. You can truly see it. It's it's easy to to really see, and that's why there's some folks online that it's so easy to gravitate towards what they're saying because you know that's just how they are. Like um, I forgot his actual Twitter handle name, but like his name's Do. Mm. He just the tweets he shares and his thinking. It's just incredible, and there's no hitting like BS behind it all. There's he's not trying to sell anything. And um, I guess that's just what I've tried to do with Regenesance is be genuine about it. And it seems like people continue to resonate with that. Yeah, there, there's, I, I think probably my favorite quote of all time is something that he tweeted, which was, um, make mistakes of ambition, not sloth. <laughs> and I, I just thought it was the most beautiful, most beautiful thing. Because it, it, if we think about so many of our regrets in life, it comes from laziness. It rarely comes from ambition. And it's just it's such a beautiful way of thinking about things. But, I mean, I wanted to, coming back to the authenticity thing, the vulnerability to tell your story or to just even just to wear the heart on the sleeve in that way, it's, fuck, man, it's so hard. Like, I... I even hold back often from from talking about like the shit I've gone through with the health stuff, whatever, because uh, that vulnerability is is hard to it's hard to express and it's hard to feel confident within expressing that vulnerability. Um, and I just I, I applaud you for being able to do that because there's uh, there's so much you can learn from those vulnerable states and. By I think what's those most vulnerable the most vulnerable aspects of ourselves are the things that are that most that is that that is most universal. Um, so I, I mean I just want to want to say thank you to you for for opening up. No, I appreciate that. Well, I've realized how necessary it's become to share that in tandem with again the Renaissance. So for example, this past weekend I was out in L.A. And I was with Case, but then I was just with meeting some other new folks. And one guy, he actually had some of my Regenesance stickers, and we were talking. And then I started 
talking and actually explaining my story and it just quickly i changed in, into more deeper conversation and i don't know i guess it just adds to the 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 authenticity of the brand and it gets more folks behind it all because again we're all really aware our side of twitter but in, in america where we're really aware now of what's going on most of america i don't know if it's it's by uh blissful ignorance but it's very easy to see you walk around and how unhealthy this country is there needs to be drastic measures to try to help out because obviously there's 330 probably 340 million americans 75 percent of them are overweight obese or severely obese not everyone there are a lot of people that are quote unquote lost cause i believe that i i know there's millions of people that will see regenesance and not think twice and they're just going to continue on with their awful habits and develop these awful chronic diseases or they already have those and they'll pass away from that i'm i'm going to, to the folks that will actually start questioning things and will take their health seriously especially the ones that want to have families or have started families and want to change that for their future bloodline. Make raw milk great again, then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's the truth. And I mean, if, once you learn about this history of behind um, how we came to this position that we're in with ter in terms of the corruption and um, just some of the laws that were created in order for us to get to this point here and um, I mean, I think raw milk is such a great example of that. Like that story is such so perfectly encompassing um, a story of maximizing profit and trying to get as rich as possible versus actually um, what is true. What is true. I, and um, I'll let you elaborate on on the story of raw milk and, and how uh, that came to be. Yeah. So raw milk, I know. The word superfood gets thrown out there a lot, but I truly believe raw milk to be a superfood. Um, the more I read on just in the 1700s and 1800s, even well before that, of folks just trying these raw milk cures and curing these ailments and diseases. But now we think in America and most of the world, it seems like, that doesn't have raw milk uh, legal, that it should be legal. Again, there's no pasteurization. It doesn't take any away of the benefits from raw milk and raw milk will kill us. But when you look at the research and the history of it all, as America was expanding and we became very industrialized and we're actually having major cities such as New York, when you compare that to the rural parts of America at that time, the folks that were drinking raw milk in rural areas were doing just fine. Hardly any health. I don't even. Hardly any health issues, if any at all. But then you look into these major cities, such as New York City. So they had awful living conditions, very unsanitary. They had thousands upon thousands of distilleries propping up, and to maximize output of milk from cows they would attach a milk or they would attach a cow around to one of these distilleries again in awful conditions no grass no sun they're just tied up but they're just f f they're fed these nasty grains from these distilleries to just fatten them up and up the production and that worked the the amount of milk that they were producing was much much higher but then what happened was that milk made everyone sick. And if you look at the mortality rates of babies in these cities, it's horrific. But that's because of this nasty milk that was produced through awful conditions. Raw milk isn't the problem. It's the living conditions, but they're fed how they're treated. That's the problem. That's what causes all these. But we're never told about that. We're never told about swill milk. And this is why I'm for Regenesis. I'm going to be really helping out a lot with raw milk this year and in the coming years with pushing back online and really helping educate because it's it's mind boggling that we've never even told about swill milk and that made sense at the time why they did pasteurize milk in cities because that was needed. 
it was needed. It definitely yeah. was because then after pasteurization happened, then mortality rates declined. But now we're still in the same thinking of it still should be illegal and pasteurized milk is the only thing we should need, which isn't true at all. We have better conditions. On my podcast, I had Mark McAfee of Raw Farm out in California, one of the largest raw dairies. They make they do so much to ensure the quality and the care of the animals and all the testing they do. He even started Raw Milk Institute to even further advance research on this, but then also help with other dairies that want to do this to ensure the conditions for these cows, but then also all of the machinery they use is sanitary to ensure that we get this raw milk because raw milk is incredible for us. It's all these beneficial bacteria and enzymes for our gut. I know that gets tossed around a lot too with gut health, but that's very true with raw milk. It he, Again, Mark McAfee, for example, whenever I asked him on my podcast to give an example of a story of a customer that raw milk healed them, he talked about how this woman had severe Crohn's disease. By six months, she was off all of her medications from raw milk and, and plus whole foods, but she was drinking a lot of raw milk. And there's so many examples of that that continue to hear. And it's just mind boggling because with pasteurization, now people believe that dairy as a whole causes lactose intolerance and all these other issues like asthma and acne. But again, with gut health, it all makes sense whenever you ingest stuff that's unnatural to your body, it responds. I mean, that's why all these skin conditions, a lot of the source is just awful gut health. And that's the case with, with raw milk because whenever you pasteurize it, it kills this enzyme called lactase. And that gives us the ability to digest lactose. What's infuriating as I continue to see more and more products in the grocery stores, for example, I see butter that's lactose-free butter and it's pasteurized dairy, but you look at the steps that they explain. Step two, they add the enzyme lactase back into it. And so you're thinking, okay, they're literally doing what's in raw milk, but not just that. Pasteurization kills a lot of the beneficial vitamins and minerals or significantly reduces them like vitamin A, C, and plenty of others. And so the more I learn about this, the more it's just like, what the hell have we been talked about this whole time? And so I, I really believe that this should be legal in all states. You should be able to make the decision yourself if you want pasteurized or raw, because there's still like Alexander Family Farms, they're not raw milk, but that dairy is still incredible for you. Dairy as a whole should be in our diets. There's so many benefits of it cheese like raw sheep cheese and, and raw cow cheese is incredible for your gut as well and so i'm just gonna leave it at that because it i actually just bought about 10 books on on various historical pieces on raw milk because it just continues to blow me away of how incredible this is and how our ancestors knew that from the beginning once we domesticated cows but all of a sudden we're the, we're the most advanced since it's been, but but yet it should be pasteurized, and we don't even question it. Yeah, isn't there some story there? I don't I don't know the truth to this, but about Rockefeller um, wanting to gain a monopoly over the dairy industry, so he lobbied for raw milk to be illegal so that all these small family friendly farms uh, wouldn't have the resources in place to be able to afford the pasteurization process is, is there some truth to that there definitely is i mean with, with rockefeller he tried to do that in a lot of industries like education too but also the rothschilds because it, i think it was in the 40s he gave a speech in england about raw milk needing to be pasteurized and outlawed but even just as a whole, dairy, for dairies, it's a disaster right now. Mark McAfee explained that 3.7 dairy farms a day are closing. A day. That's insane. And, uh, and is that across the world or just in no, the No, just in America. Holy shit. And 
big dairy is huge. They, they control the whole industry. They work with big ag and government and, you know, do the donations to get what they want. And I was, I, I wrote a post a couple of days ago on Instagram. One of them about there's two states, Colorado and Delaware working to get better raw milk laws. I th- Delaware, they only had, I know Delaware is an extremely small state, but they went from, I think, 42 or 43 dairies to only 16 or 17. I did another podcast with Grassway Organics in Wisconsin, and he was explaining the same thing. Just so many dairies are closing. It's so hard to start. Um, and if you're wanting raw dairy, you're having to go through so many. You have to jump through so many hoops just to get around. Um, so, again, that's why we as consumers can really change the game and that's how we vote with our dollar and and how we support the farmers and ranches which is why i preach not necessarily just farmers markets actually going to the farms and ranchers because you see it yourself it's hard to explain other than you just feel more connected to this world you truly do and then you have that food after talking to these farmers and ranches it just adds a whole nother it's the missing link. That's why I keep going back to that. I, I can't explain it other than that. When I worked on the farm, when I had this food, it's just like, holy shit, these 27 years up until now, what have I been doing? And now I, it's just part of my life now. And part of, a, I guess, your lifestyle. Yeah. And with, yeah, with raw milk, once you start drinking that, and again, having these conversations with the actual dairy farms, it can really shift your perspective on, on things. Totally. I mean, it is just so absurd how many people who are dealing with chronic health conditions simply make the switch to eating real food and everything goes well. And you can make it with dairy too. Ice cream, raw milk ice cream is a health food if you do it correctly. But then also to the just the digestibility Again, I was out in LA, a guy, he's starting his own, um, I guess just raw milk ice cream business, but he's talking about, he's always eating ice cream pretty much every day, but before raw milk, he would eat, you know, just the normal store bought ice cream, which is pasteurized. And a lot of the, the ice cream he would eat, he would have digestive issues. And he mentioned the moment he would try raw milk ice cream, those went away immediately. And I hear that story time and time again. Um, but also with that, I want to say not everyone will be able to properly digest raw cow's milk fully. That's just how it is. There's also a one and a two, but then if you can't digest any of that, sheep milk and goat milk is way more digestible for us as well. So I don't, that's another thing that I'm trying to get out with, with education we view everything in black and white. There's no nuance. So with this is just another example. There is nuance to that. So not everyone. I'm just going to leave it with that. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, yeah, there's there's such a lack of nuance, whether it is in, in every aspect. Like it's just running so rampant, I guess, social media and the rise of clickbait type of headlines, even though that's always been there. But it, it's just been magnified now in the age of social media. There's there's such a lack of nuance with things. And I mean, even like hearing what you were saying before about going to all these medically trained doctors and them not being able to do shit and then going to an 18 or did you say an 18 or 19 year old kid? Yeah, he was, I think he was 19 at the time. 19. And he, and he was able to, uh, to provide you with the resources to help you make that that switch and i mean it's so it's so terrifying and just crazy like i i um i've been having a lot of conversations with physicians and um one in particular told me like he solely 100 percent believes in the power of exactly what we're just saying of whole foods um and the power of sunlight and grounding and and just returning back to nature in terms of healing chronic conditions. But he still will prescribe the standard treatment of care to his patients because he is in debt from medical school and doesn't want to lose his medical license. And he's just put in this very 
awkward, weird position. And it it's such a weird paradox now that I, I've come to realize is that for a lot of people, you almost have to look outside of the medical community to get the actual root cause treatment that you're seeking. It's wild. It is. And I mean, it's, you made up a good point too with Dr. And, and grounding in sunlight and just reconnecting back to the natural world because this is what I've realized again because we've been so disconnected from our food the further we 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 stray away from nature the worse our health gets nature provides everything we need with food with clothes that's why I didn't even talk about that with apparel everything that I release is 100% natural fibers because I learned just how toxic polyester and all these other synthetic fibers are, which is derived from petroleum, which is plastic too. And so you have these toxic materials on your body, but then with grounding and, and whatnot, you truly feel better. I, I can't explain other than that, but then you also just feel more a sense of connection to this world. We yeah. have lost a sense of community as people, but I think we've just lost a sense of community to this earth as hippie, that as that sounds with with agriculture again the conventional model that we've been doing it's against nature when you go back to the dust bowl and look at what happened it's because we we overplowed like crazy and that destroys the soil destroys the biology that's going on in that soil and how does nature respond by the dust bowl whenever we don't take care of the animals and we feed them all this nasty crap Whenever we eat that food, it's not so great for us. It responds. And again, going back to the unnatural products, grocery stores is nearly 75% of it is unnatural, ultra processed food. What causes, what does that cause? It causes chronic inflammation, which causes all these diseases that are so prevalent in America. Every time we go against nature, it always responds back to us one way or another. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is so beautifully said. It's such a truth. And I mean, as I'm sure you know, like you see those those things now of how messed up our soil quality is and how that is reflected back at us in terms of the nutrient density of certain foods. Like you look at, I forget what it was, like um, in order to get the nutrient density that your great grandpa would have gotten from an orange, you would need to eat like eight oranges to yep. get that same amount of vitamins and minerals that that were prevalent in that orange in, in the past i mean think um, about why we need to supplement magnesium because everyone oh, yeah, should be exactly. supplementing magnesium but that's because it's yes. been completely depleted mm -hmm. and magnesium is is one of those that it's like you just look at how essential it is for the human body and how much of a lack of it everyone's getting and um I won't share who it is, but an individual that you and me both know pretty well was dealing with very um, bad, what got him into this world of health was dealing with very bad anxiety and, and mental health issues. And he started reading Grim Hood's content, who, who's a creator on Twitter that um, we both know, and he's all about magnesium. So he was like, all right, I'm going to give this a try. And just the magnesium alone cured his mental health conditions. And, um, and it, it's like, it, it's crazy what the consequences of all these actions are that that's going on in our health and magnesium is just one example of it. And it's just, we got to be diligent and we got to, we got to return back to the way things were if we want to be healthy. Agreed. Yeah. So when, what, what's this crowd health thing that, that you were, uh, that you mentioned before yeah so it's technically not health insurance how it works it's freaking amazing the owner andy is just trying to really disrupt the healthcare industry because it's how he explains it i wholeheartedly agree it's like a cartel that hospitals are working with health insurance that's working with pharma and they control it all uh again i gave my example of because of their fuck up, they added $3,000 to my bill. They, him and their, the team at Crowd Health, they work with the billing side of things. So you upload your bill, 
and they try to they work with it and bring it down as much as they can. You pay the first 500 of whatever that bill is, and then the rest is covered through essentially crowdfunding because you pay a monthly fee for crowd health, and then you're just covering one another. And mm. it is incredible because again, that $3,000 bill, I only paid 500 of that. I think about all of the other BS uh, trips I've had to make to a hospital or a doctor mis misdiagnosing or misprescribing. And I think about all those cases for others that might not be able to pay that $3,000. So they just went into complete debt or bankruptcy because there's so many medical bankruptcies that happen. So crowd health is such an awesome alternative that I cannot recommend enough to at least look into. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't looked too much into this world, but like, and just seeing, hearing stories and seeing firsthand of how expensive that whole world is and how much, ooh, like you're, you're in, you're put in such a bad position if you don't have great health care. Even if you do have great health care, like you can be in a very, very hard spot. And um, well, that's the, that's the thing that a lot of times your health care doesn't even get covered. Yeah. He, I wish I could go back and share. I went to a talk that Andy was explaining. It was mind boggling. The, the stories that he was sharing about folks with healthcare, but a lot of their bills weren't being covered. It's just like, what's, what's the hell is the point of healthcare then? Yeah. If it's, if it's not going to cover you at, at all. And uh, yeah, so he's just trying to decentralize a system that's so centralized and I'm very, I'm very bullish. Yeah. Shout out Andy shit. Um, when it goes back to the synthetic fibers and stuff. So I, I, that's a topic that um, I haven't really discussed too much on, on the podcast, but um, when you learn about how so many of our clothes nowadays are literally made out of plastic and petroleum, like you, like you were just describing um, and how, when you sweat, a lot of those uh, toxins leach into you. It is crazy. Um, how fucked up the the world of fabric is and it's something that we don't even we aren't even consciously aware of just think about how every time that you're drying those clothes you're heating and reheating up plastic that you eventually put back on your body and your skin is your largest organ of your body you've got to protect it why yeah. does polyester cause reduction in sperm counts and increase rates of of testicular cancer why is it such an endocrine disruptor and can cause breast cancer? There's, and then you start thinking about your pillows that you, that you sleep on, your bedding, everything. Cause a lot of that is polyester. You look at all of high end apparel and fashion. A lot of that is polyester. They are making so much money off of you without realizing it. Cause so my shirts that you see back there, it's hundred percent organic cotton. I have them priced at $40. You could probably get a shirt that looks just like that. That's made out of polyester for about $5, but that's because the cost of labor is extremely cheap. We outsourced everything to Asia and they obviously use slave labor, but then the cost of the materials is very, very cheap. So you'll have a $150 dress that's majority polyester or another synthetic fiber. And they're making a $145 profit off of you without even realizing it. And, uh, yeah, so once I started learning about that, I knew right away from the start that I was never going to touch synthetic fibers uh, for my apparel because the apparel industry, like every other industry, is very destroyed. Only 3% of the world's organic cotton production is now in America. Most of it is in India, China, and Turkey. Um, so I'm trying to bring back that to once I'm able to gain enough leverage with my brand, I want to work directly with farmers to to produce organic cotton and, and controlled all of that. But that is such a long-term goal because of just how destroyed the whole industry has become. Cause they, oh. the last thing too, you look at Patagonia, they're about climate change and, and environmental friendly. A lot of their stuff's polyester. They're full of shit. They're just, yeah. they're just virtue signaling because they're one of the top brands and they can do that because no one's really aware. We, we, you see what they're saying and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm supporting a good cause, but also it feels good and looks looks cool. Couldn't be further from the truth. 
That's why I got my Renaissance shorts on right now. That's why I'm making sure I'm wearing <laughs> all cotton. Um, dude, it's awesome. And so you are, uh, you're re, you're doing a, another drop today, right? So yes, sir. Let's go. To, today's so I had it again. I was just saying I launched on May 28th of last year, but I actually had closed my shop December 17th or 18th of last year and reopening today, February 1st. That was because my health was continuing to get worse and worse with the stress of scaling my business. But also after losing my mother, I now realized I was doing way worse than I thought. So I took the executive decision to close my shop, uh, a little short term pain for a long term gain. But now I'm glad I, I'm so glad I made that decision because I'm feeling great. I uh, feeling good about this reopening and there's so much I have in store that's planned and yeah, just the conversations I'm having with people on the side. I'm so stoked to see where this goes. Me as well, brother. Me as well. I'm seeing it firsthand. It's like, Ooh, I can't wait, man. I can't wait. I'm, I'm super excited to see that. And I mean, I don't think we realized like to your point before of how big of a role stress plays in the de deterioration of our health. Like, if you are taking on a big burden and you are under loads of stretch, stress that just proliferates and, and causes so many issues, and, and it's, um, it's a hard thing to get under control because it's such a vicious cycle. It is. It's, I mean, I, that's why I, I went through like three vicious cycles before realizing, okay, I need to close my shop because this is too much. Have you ever, just out of curiosity, because... Um, you know, this world of like therapy and talk therapy um, is one that is debated. And um, there's a lot of men who have a reluctance to do something like that. Have you have you done any any of that stuff? Yeah, I hated it. And that's why you I go back. I, I go back to finding your mission, finding your tribe and never giving up. Because as a man, without a mission, we turn to destruction we destroy ourselves i think that's why so many men are so addicted to sports betting porn video games sports it's all escapism because they lack a purpose in life with a tribe we don't we lack community especially men i mean there's just more and more statistics take it as you will but it just seems like the ever-increasing loneliness for men you need that tribe because again Whenever shit hits the fan, you should be going to them and they should be there to support you. Uh, you should have those vulnerable conversations with one another. Why the hell would I have a vulnerable conversation with just some random person online that I will never probably meet, that I've never known, versus people that I trust my life with? I mean, there's a difference between being a huge burden on somebody and using them versus being their friend. So obviously you have to tweet tier between that, but I think the mission and tribe will do way more for your mental health than actual mental health therapy. I mean, that's the truth. That's I mean, I, I'm just going to say, I think therapy is for women and it could be helpful for some men, especially with extremely traumatic things to where you might not realize that you stored in your body. But I will argue for majority of men, therapy is not even neutral. It's, it's bad for you. And you should be focusing on trying to find good men to surround yourself with and then a, a mission a purpose in life. Why do you think it, it, it could even be something that's negative? Because the advice they give you is just makes your life worse mm, and you're sense. not tackling the root cause. It's the same example of people taking an Ozempic to lose weight whenever you're not addressing any root cause and you're, you're worsening your health and you're, it could, it's probably going to cause cancer and other chronic issues. Same thing with therapy. You could be causing chronic issues from what they're telling you. And it's just rewiring your, your, your brain for the worse. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I, I I mean, I, I wonder that a lot of times with therapy, too, because it's like the philosophy that they have in terms of like their beliefs and biases and in terms of how you should be doing things are a little bit. It's um, 
I, it, like the example that comes to mind is I, I think Chris Williamson gave this analogy that um, male depression is treated the same as female depression, where men, where uh, they treat like in talk therapy, they treat men to try to feel loved when they really should be making them try to feel more powerful. Exactly. Um, and that goes back to the purpose and life because it's not addressing the root cause. You can do all this talking and then you go out to the real world and you still lack purpose and you still lack a tribe. You're going to re revert back to those awful habits that you probably had had and your mental will continue yeah. to decline because it's not, it's not addressing anything that's brought you there in the first place. Yeah. We need to, we need to start a uh, based therapy. <laughs> we need to get we need to get some stoicism and some some people with with a mindset of uh, uh that have a deep understanding of these things and, i mean it's it's definitely a um part of our culture that i don't think that we we realize enough that you know there's there's ways and philosophies out there that that truly do make a huge impact in in terms of your mental health and i mean i just think about it like I'm always internally grateful that I stumbled upon stoicism um, because it, it became my consoling religion at hard times in my life of understanding that the obstacle is the way and control what you can control and just these mantras that are spoken within it. It's like these are things that have a major tangible effect for your mental health. Agreed. Mr. Ryan Griggs, is there anything we haven't talked about today that you think is fundamental to you your story or just the message you want to get across the last thing i'll say is if you don't go on walks do that that <laughs> was the first thing after my brother died that was the first practice as you will that i implemented in my day that transformed my whole life to now if i'm not taking walks and i'm not getting sunshine i just feel like a cooped up animal in a cage but I mean, again, that's how I got the idea for Renaissance. I was just on a walk, no music or anything, just enjoying the weather and nature. It really helps with your mental a lot. But then it's very subtle. At least for me, it seems like it's been very subtle to where now I walk 12,000 steps a day. But that kind of just snowballed into doing other beneficial activities in my, my life and just thinking more health conscious, I guess, in a way. Yeah. I mean, you see those, um, those pictures of like a brain scan when you're on a walk versus when you're sitting still and how much more active the brain is. It's like, shit, that's walking. Walking really, really does make a huge impact in terms of thinking through things and coming up with ideas. It's crazy. The last thing, I mean, if you go on a walk, that's why Something as simple as going walk in your neighborhood and you just hear birds chirping. Again, it just gives you that gratitude and peace of mind. Uh, because I never walk with headphones in or, or anything like that. Because that kind of takes away from the actual meaning of it all. I mean, you could be listening to podcasts and, and phone calls and, and whatnot. But if you're doing that every single walk, give it a shot without any tech. And just enjoy your surroundings if you can. Because uh, Again, that, that adds to the to the gratitude of life. Mr. Ryan Griggs, I'm grateful for you, brother. And this Likewise. was a conversation that I um, have been looking forward to having for a long time. And it definitely was the most powerful conversation I've had on this podcast. And <laughs> we've done 110 of these. So um, just just so much love for you, brother. And I I have so much respect for the path that you're on and the path you continue to do. And I'm excited to see it grow. I appreciate you, man. Thank you for having me.